Welcome to the Good Friday service, this time of worship as we continue in the footsteps of Jesus. We are on that critical day when for us, for our transgressions, for our condition, Jesus indeed was crucified. So here we are on a day that has become known to us in all of its very real horror, it has become known to us as Good Friday. We understand why it is that, and for the willingness of Jesus not to flinch from his mission, we give him thanks today, and we honor and glorify the name of the Lord. We had a wonderful service last night, and again, we have folks with us from Church of the Good Hope and we welcome you and we welcome Pastor Scott Miller with us. I'm glad that we have these opportunities to come together as a worshiping body and as a community of faith. And for that, we are thankful. So welcome. Welcome to the worship service this afternoon. Be aware of the uh, announcements that are pertinent to all of us who are a part of Faith Memorial Church. And if you do not have a church home, we welcome you as well. On Resurrection Sunday, we will have breakfast together at 9.30 a.m., followed by our 10.30 a.m. worship service. And involved in that service will be not only the celebration of our risen Savior, but we will conclude the service with a baptismal time. And we always are grateful for those who want to express their faith in a visible and tangible way by being baptized in the name of of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So we look forward to Resurrection Sunday and encourage you to be preparing your hearts for that great day. And may God bless us as we gather together. If you would please, let's stand together and we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious Father, on this day that we remember and on this momentous day that is for Jesus the fulfillment of the incarnation, the purpose for his coming, that which parts history forever, <clears throat> we are grateful, Jesus, for your atoning work. We are grateful that you went to the cross. We are forever indebted that you died for us. And not just for us, but for the sins of the entire world. You have died for every human being. What a debt we owe. How thankful we are. But also, Lord, how glad we are to be able to tell this story. Our world needs this truth more than ever. We pray, Father, that we would be your faithful ambassadors, filled with your spirit, going into the world and saying, yes, indeed, our hope is in Christ crucified. Our hope is in Jesus. Our hope is in a Savior who suffered, died for us, who bled for us that we might be set free from sin. We thank you today for Good Friday. Bless us as we worship together, write truth in a fresh way on our hearts and on our minds. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's remain standing as Paul Cook will come to lead us and allow for us to respond to God's word. These words are found in Isaiah 53, 1 through 6. Who has believed our message? To whom has the Lord revealed his powerful arm? My servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot, like a root in dry ground. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with the deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised, and we did not care. Yet it was our weakness he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. 
and we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins, but he was pierced for our rebellion. He was crushed for our sins. He was beaten so that we could be made whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone away astray. We have left God's paths to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. Would you sing together with us? Good morning. Oh, wait, that's right. Good afternoon. <laughs> you can probably guess who slept in this morning. But our kids are not with us until tomorrow afternoon. So I will sleep in tomorrow as well, and I will stay up very late tonight. But uh, it, is, it is good to be, to be with you all, and I appreciate the privilege of being able to speak uh, for Good Friday service. And uh, I can't say it enough, uh, the benefit I have with working uh, with a staff that I work with. And uh, I see Pastor Mel there, and Pastor Jonathan behind me, Pastor Lauren, Pastor Mike, and Dr. Case. Um, it, it really is a privilege. And someday, when I'm done here, I will tell you I've stuck with Pastor Jonathan for almost 15 years. And I will tell all. Well, I knew who I would be speaking to today. I kind of had an idea. You know, we, we kind of know who, who is at the Good Friday service, right? And uh, so this message is, is, is kind of tailored for the ears of those who I know would be with us today. It may be a little different. Uh, tone of Good Friday message that, that you usually hear, and I hope you give me that leniency. I am a youth pastor, right? So I need a lot of 
leniency. And this is about the size of a big youth group, so uh, we're, gonna have, we're gonna have a little bit of fun today um, looking at the scripture, uh, maybe in a little different way. I wanna challenge you. I wanna challenge you to think about, your, to, to think about where you are currently in uh, your walk with Christ. Some of you may think, well, um, you know, I've been walking with Christ. Time. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what the Lord has left for me to do. And uh, and you know, I'm kind of, I'm kind of in a spot where I just don't feel the Lord working. Uh, opportunity just just isn't there like it used to be. And let me tell you, um, wherever you're at today, I just want you to say and consider uh, the prayer this morning, Lord. What do you have me to do? Is there room, is there room in my heart for you to still work around me? And we'll get to some stories. We're gonna have a few stories I'm gonna offer you today. But uh, we're going to consider two different kinds of hearts this morning. We're gonna look at the difference between somebody with a hard heart and somebody with a softened heart. And it's very important that we understand uh, those two because you know, lots, lots of times there could be somebody in our own congregation, people sitting right down the pew for, from you, who is dealing with a hard heart. But in the same way, there could be somebody out of our church that's never been in the doors of our church, never had a conversation about God at all with anyone, and their heart is softened. Their heart is primed for hearing what Christ did on the cross for you and what he wants to do on the cross for him or her. Amen? Okay. You're going to have to say amen a lot today, all right? I need, I need a lot of reassurance in front of, in front of a group that's not youth, okay? But, in, but we're also going to look at, and we're going to consider Good Friday from the contrasting viewpoints of the two thieves on the cross. And I think the, the, the slide is up there. We see Jesus, but we also to, see two thieves who were cruci crucified along with him. So let's consider the first thief. The first thief... <laughs> Boy, he held on to his stubbornness and his self-centeredness until the very end. And I think a few of us in here know what it means to be stubborn. In fact, sometimes we say the word stubborn, and we use that uh, as a trait that maybe we might think there's something good about that. The definition of stubborn is having or showing dogged determination, one's attitude or position on something spite of good arguments or reasons to do so. And this is what we see with the thief on the cross who ridiculed Jesus and said, prove to me that you are the Lord, knowing that no amount of proof in the world could change his mind. As evidence mounted against this thief's worldview, he only became more entrenched in his own ways and defensive of the delusion that would eventually end in his destruction. But then it doesn't stop there. We have the story of the other thief. The other thief. What did the other thief say? We deserve to die. But this man has done nothing wrong. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. I don't know, this may have been the first time, the first opportunity that this other thief had to hear about and to see, <laughs> in a very pronounced way, the evidence of who Jesus was, what he came to do, and what he can do in the life of somebody who is just on the edge, just on the edge of entering into eternity. John 8, 28 through 37 says, Jesus said, when you have lifted up the Son of Man on the cross, you will understand that I am he. I do nothing on my own, but say only what the Father taught me, and the one who sent me is with me. He has not deserted me, for I always do what pleases him. Then many, of, then many who heard him say these things believed in him. Jesus said to the people who believed in him, you are truly my disciples, if you remain faithful to my teachings. 
and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. But we are descendants of Abraham, they said. We got a lot of butts around here, don't we, in our lives? We have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean you will set us free? Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. A slave is not a permanent member of the family, but a son, but a son is part of the family forever. So if the son sets you free, you are truly free. Yes, I realize that you are descendants of Abraham, and yet some of you are trying to kill me because there's no room in your hearts for my, for my message. Now, I'm a youth pastor, you all know that, and uh, there are lots of privileges uh, that comes with being a youth pastor. One of those is from time to time, I get to be imprisoned in a dorm room for multiple days at a time with middle school and high schoolers. Now you think about that. You think about spending a few nights in a very close quartered dorm room with a bunch of middle school boys or middle school girls. And I feel the same way about it as you do, okay? Um, that is not something that comes natural to me. Two, there was one thing that I could dispense of with ministry, that would be sleeping in a bunk bed, in a dorm room, with boys that stink and that stink really bad. In fact, a couple weekends ago, we had spring retreat. I showed up. Many of you know I'm the ECY uh, president, and uh, so you know what? I'm somewhat important. I keep telling Pastor Jonathan that, but uh, it doesn't seem to really phase him at all. But uh, they said, listen, we have a room for you down in the leader's lodge. And for several seconds, if not a minute or so, I pondered taking up that offer. But then I said, you know what? No, I, I, won't. I, I got quite a few boys here. I'll just, I'll just stay, stay in the dorm. I had a way out, but I stayed in the dorm. And it wasn't a couple hours later. And I'm not kidding. It was just a couple hours later. I walked back in that dorm, and there were boys who were hanging out. And I exclaimed, what is that smell? This place smells horrible. You guys have only been here for one afternoon. And I'm walking around, and I'm smelling the different, I'm, I'm smelling the boys, I'm smelling the beds. I'm like, what is that smell? You guys ever walk into a, you ever been in a dog pound? Okay. I, no, I'm serious. Well, I use, you know, I, I've, I've shopped for dogs in my life, and you walk in that, you know, the back room of the dog shelter, and all of a sudden that smell just kind of wham, it hits you, right? And you have to get used to it. You got to like, you know, you got to like you know, get yourself steady to go look at the, you know, cute little dog. But that's what it smelled like. And so I'm walking around, and, and you know, I, 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 came to a, I came to a bed. A, 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 he wasn't a part of our church. And it was obvious that, you know, he came from a, a very uh, probably dirty home, and his stuff just smelled like dirty animals. And you guys might say, well, Aaron, this is pretty shy to think like that. But in times like that, you know, I get kind of worked up, you know, the Lord puts me in places I don't want to be sometimes, and I... And, uh, and I pause, and I think, man, I, I, I consider what Christ did for me on the cross to allow me to be at the point that I am right now. Who in the world am I to say, no, Lord, I think I'll set this one out today. I think I'll just avoid this situation or not have this conversation today. Who am I? Now, I, just last night I was talking to, to Rich and Linda Klinger, and I see that Rich is here, right, Rich? Yeah. Linda's not here? Okay, we won't ask why, but she was here last night. But Rich, <laughs> you know, they lost a son in a car accident um, many years ago. I know what that's like. I watched my parents deal with the same thing. And Rich and Linda, they, you know, they know the urgency. They understand the delicate nature of life, don't you, Rich? Yeah. He has a different understanding of time and souls because of that situation. 
And he also knows the profound graciousness of God. And at one point over the last few, few years, Rich simply said, I'm willing. I'm willing to be used. I'm willing to share what Christ did on the cross for me. Do you understand? Did you hear? Willing. He didn't say, when I get enough confidence, when I feel less embarrassed about it, um, when I develop my speaking skills, when I have a clear way to explain the steps to knowing God, then I'll do it. No, he just said, I'm willing. So what Rich does, what he's been doing for a few years now, he goes to our detention center down the street. He goes down to Ross County Detention Center to give Bible studies. He goes over to New Lexington to visit somebody who's been in the system and now out. That's what Rich does because he said, I'm willing. Now listen, I've been in these situations, a room full of jailed adolescents. You're going to have all types in there. You're going to have some who just look at you and just, and may even do whatever they can to distract and defend. But then right next to them, there is a youth who might have tears running down his or her eyes. And you ask, do you want to know Christ? And the answer is, yes, I want to know Christ. I've never heard about Christ. Rich, am I lying? I'm not lying. I'm not even remotely exaggerating. What was Christ's response to the thief who asked Jesus to remember him when he entered his kingdom? And this is a real question, right? You're a youth group. You can be a youth group today. I ask a lot of questions in my youth group, and they just kind of scream at me. Sometimes they throw things. Don't do that. But uh, what was Christ's response when the thief said, remember me today when you enter your kingdom? What did he say? Today you will be with me in paradise. And some of us whoa, hold up a minute. It's that easy? Can someone's heart be, be, can someone from that lifestyle and that situation and that setting be so close to accepting Christ as their Lord and Savior? Is that all there is to it? Absolutely not, and I would hope that, uh, that we understand that's, you know, initial salvation is just the start of, uh, you know, something. But let's back up just a little bit. Let's not forget what we're talking about today. Jesus said this to this man on the cross, but what was happening just a few hours later? We, we, we know about Jesus being turned away by the crowd, the whole crowd, everybody, crucify him. He was led away from the crowd to be whipped. He was whipped, not just with, you know, a whip that we might see on TV. This was a whip that was covered with pieces of metal that ripped the flesh off as they pulled it back time after time, flesh getting ripped off. It was a very, very raw scene. And it's even a scene that I have a difficult time watching sometimes look, seeing the depiction in movies. The Passion, the Bible, movies like that. You know what? What does it look like when somebody bears the full weight of sin on their back? How awful, how terrible, how imprisoned does sin make somebody? We need to go no further than to see what Jesus, what happened to Jesus when he bared the weight of of our sin. It's the stone the builders rejected. When a light shines in the darkness, it exposes things that are more comfortable to be kept hidden. And the cross should always serve as a reminder for us the price that was paid for our sin. And we owe all to him. We owe all to him. We just don't owe 
Sundays, Wednesdays, and times when it's super convenient to give to him and just say the rest of the hours are my own. Now, now, don't look at Pastor Aaron and say, you know, wow, Aaron. Listen, I struggle with this all the time. I was in a conversation with somebody that was working for me just the other day, and, and, we were, and the Lord said, Aaron, say something to this man. Say, and I didn't do it. I, you know, we, we just kind of talked and talked and talked, and he left, and I felt horrible about it. I never saw that man again. He moved. He moved to California. And, but then just the other day, I was in a, another situation with two, un, you know, two of my peers, friends, who they're not Christians. And uh, the Lord, and I was getting ready to leave that setting. And the Lord just, I mean, don't go. Wait just a few more seconds. And I was like, okay. And because you guys know me, I'm, I'm kind of weird and, you know, conversations and clo- I, I'm a little distracted and not, people tell me that, whatever. And so I kind of zoom in and out. But the Lord said, wait, you need to stay here for a few more seconds. And so I waited. I just sat there. And one of the guys said something. And it was so obvious that this was the fork in the road that Jesus was, said is going to be here for you to have. And we entered into a conversation about the cross of Jesus and what was happening this week. I don't know where that will go, but First uh, Corinthians one eighteen. The message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed for destruction, but we who are being saved. No, it is the very power of God. And this is where we're going to just spend a, a little bit, a couple minutes talking about a hard-hearted person. That conversation that I just said that I had with two of my peers, you know, one of those men, um, I think that's what he's dealing with. But the other one, man, so close, so close. You know, to those who have been living for so long according to their own terms, they become unaware of their present dire circumstance. And I'm reminded of, you know, the first man, the the first thief on the cross that we talked about. There is a point, and this is a sad reality, my friends, and and, and I have conversations with other pastors about this. It is, there is a point to which someone has so long dismissed the voice of God that the voice of God is no longer recognized. They start to resemble the thief on the cross who says, prove to me that you are the Messiah. In their eyes, the problem is a lack of God's working and intervening in their lives and in this world. They just think, you know what? God's got to prove himself to me somehow. He's not at work. Nothing's going on. And to them, it has nothing to do with their dismissal of their need for him. Matthew 13, 15. For the hearts of these people are hardened and their ears cannot hear. And they have closed their eyes, so their eyes cannot see, and their ears cannot hear, and their hearts cannot understand. And, and they cannot turn to me and let me heal them. Just a quick example. Again, like I said, these may be people in our church. Um, these may be people all, all around you. And somebody with a pliable, soft, ready to give their life to Christ. Maybe somebody out in your neighborhood. Maybe your neighbor. It's not for us to decide, my friends. There was a young lady in a youth group, a teenage girl in my youth group that I was at before coming here. And, uh, you know, she was in a, in a car accident with other, other teenage girls, and the car rolled, and, and uh, nobody fortunately lost their life, but they came very close. She was super banged up and bruised and cut up. And I remember going over to her house. Rachel and I went over 
to her house. Her mom was in the living room. She was laying on the couch with a blanket over her face. You know, and she was a, you know, she was a, um, you know, popular, uh, attractive, um, well-liked, lots of friends. And, uh, and her family was always in church. But she had stopped coming to church um, at some point, and it had been quite a while. And I remember going up to the couch and leaning over and, you know, just a few feet from her and praying for her. And I don't, I don't get, uh, you know, I, I'm not a very emotional person, really. But I remember just starting to cry when I was praying for her and then when I was talking to her and looking to her. And it, it, was, it, was, it was about the um, realization that she had no interest in the things of God. Her heart had become hardened. And that brought tears to my eyes. The hard heart. She had the truth, but had so many times said, not today, not today, maybe tomorrow. Kind of like Plato, right? If you've had kids, you've had Plato. I have Plato around my house. I don't like Plato. But outside, <laughs> outside of its intended container and the purpose that it is for, and if it's not used for that, you know what happens to Plato, right? It becomes hardened over time. It loses, and there's, there's, a, there's a correlation here, so let's grab it. It loses its sensitivity to the one holding it, the one pushing it, pulling it, and sometimes pressing in rather firmly and putting it through something to change its shape. This is not to say that every heart becomes hard over time, but that time is not a friend to a wayward heart. Now, this may be the first time, if it works, that you have ever had a part of a podcast played in this sanctuary. And I'm pretty happy about that. I'm pretty proud to be the first one to play part of a podcast. But let me just set this up here. You're only going to hear, you're only going to hear um, audio. And this is an interview that happened a couple weeks ago on the radio station of a show. It's not a Christian station. It wasn't a Christian show. This was an MS-13 gang member, right? We're hearing a lot, of, a lot about these bad characters coming in you know, to the United States. And this person that we hear is now a middle-aged man, but he is referring back to his time in Folsom State Prison, where he was and um, he was there for, I think, around 12, 13, 14 years. The first three years, he was in solitary confinement at age 16 for murder and has several um, convictions of robbery, uh, assault, stabbings, things of those nature, things of that nature. And he, and he tells about what happened when an older lady from a small church decided to visit him in prison. I think we have it. Now, were you in solitary the whole 12 years? Uh, no, I was in solitary for three, uh, three years and some change. All right, so I can't have you 16 years old and you're in solitary confinement and you got, you know, 12 years total. I mean, you must be going out of your mind in that cell. Um, you know, uh, you, you, um, when you're at, at that kind of level of, um, uh, of violence and in, in that kind of category um, inside the gang, you really don't, uh, you don't care. You, you don't, you're very careless and life is very cheap and, you know, uh, it, it's almost like a game and, and a game that you're actually enjoying. That's, that's the reality of it. So the, the book goes into the story about this elderly woman who reaches out to you, paid you a visit, and all of a sudden you began to quietly, I guess, reflect and sort of like you had a spiritual awakening, I assume, when you were in solitary confinement. That's correct, yeah. Um, this lady, uh, the, it, she belonged to a very small church, and uh, they would come there once a, once a month, and um, she just interacted with me. She was very bold um, and, and, and just a strong lady. 
And she made it a point to tell me that, you know, she was going to pray for me and that Jesus was going to use me. And I, don't, I didn't have any um, religious background or I never had opened a Bible. Never, I wasn't interested in any of that. So for me to hear that from her, it was just kind of, uh, it was strange to me. I, I thought she was, uh, you know, had some loose marbles and didn't know what she was doing. But she, know, she knew exactly what she was doing, and she was praying and interceding for my life. And, and, um, and I had an encounter with, with Christ in my cell, in, in that solitary cell. What happened? And which made me uh, uh, step down from my, my gang leadership uh, there at New Folsom State Prison. Isn't that a problem if you step down or step out of a gang? Don't you then, you know, become a target? Uh, absolutely, yeah. Uh, a hit was put on my life. Uh, a green light is what we called it uh, because I stepped down and... Um, they sent one of my very own uh, gang members uh, to do the, you know, to what what, what we call uh, taking out the trash. That meant, you know, when you got to get rid of somebody in there. And they sent one of my very own, and uh, that was the the person, the first person that I actually led to Christ uh, in there. And um, there was a few other uh, gang members. One uh, founder of the MS-13 that was there. Uh, I led him to Christ as well. And for two years, we went through some. Uh, some pretty big persecution for stepping down from our leadership. So, and let's let's just kind of close it with actually reading the scripture. I've just been kind of uh, moving around this whole time. It's it's Luke twenty three thirty two through forty three. Two others, both criminals, were led out to be executed with him. When they came to a place called the Skull, they nailed him to a cross, and the criminals were also crucified. And the criminals were also crucified, one on his right and one on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. I may have given the wrong scripture. And the soldiers, or Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. The crowd watched and the leaders scoffed. He saved others, they said. Let him save himself if he is really God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers mocked him too. By offering him a drink of sour wine, they called out to him, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. A sign was fastened above him with these words, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals hanging beside him scoffed, So you're the Messiah, are you? Prove it by saving yourself and us too while you're at it. But the other criminal protested, Don't you fear God even when you have sentenced been sentenced to die. We deserve to die for our crimes, but this man hasn't done anything wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, I assure you, today you will be with me in paradise. And we close with this thought, that is good news for someone who has no hope. And friends, there is a growing lack of hope in our society. Suicide rate, anxiety, depression is skyrocketing between those 10 and 34 years old. In fact, suicide and drug abuse is taking down the life expectancy. Our life expectancy just announced again that it has decreased two times in a row since they, since they have uh, uh, last kept track, and that is because of the deaths that are happening in those between 10 and 35 years old. And they say that is due to a lack of hope, turning to drugs, which often lead to suicide. Good news. We have good news. Do you want God's kingdom to reign in your heart? <laughs> this is the good news, my friend. And do you want assurance that you will be with God in paradise forever? Then all you have to do is put your full faith and trust in Christ alone. Is that too uncomfortable to share? Well, in some situations it is. But I think that's what we're being called to do, all of us. And I close with this story. This is the way it happens. If you think that, that Pastor Aaron is going to evangelize the teens in Lancaster on his own, I mean, back in the day, I thought I could probably do that. And I actually tried a few times and almost left the ministry. <laughs> and I feel really badly. I don't remember her name. But maybe as I go along, one of you can, 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 can uh, uh, throw out her name to me. She lived on Uber... Avenue, 
She passed away a few years ago. She sat back there, went here for years and years, older lady. Lived across the street from John and Janet Young. Anybody yet? Okay, okay. Who? I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll keep moving, though. But she came to me one day. I mean, she was, I don't know how old she was, but man, she was, she was energetic. And she came to me and said, Pastor Aaron, I don't know if you know this person, but I'm praying for my neighbor. She's a teenage girl, and she needs the Lord. And it wasn't just, I'm praying for my neighbor. I'm talking to her about Jesus. I'm inviting her to church. And she's like, you know, and, and I'm like, well, what do you want me to do? I mean, uh, it sounds like, you know, you got it under control. And this went on for a few weeks, and then this, this girl showed up. And then after a few weeks, this girl who was 16 brought her brother to church. And then when younger sister became a teenager, younger sister started coming to church. And for a few years, <laughs> they received the truth. And I know for certain that one of those three gave their, their life to Christ. And uh, he since graduated and moved on. But this was because one woman, at the end of her life, recognized another life that was many decades younger than her, but an opportunity was there to share Christ to somebody who did not know him. And that's what she did. What does it mean to really identify with Christ and his suffering, to take up your cross daily? As we sing and pray, I'm not exactly sure in what order we're going to do that. A few weeks ago, we, we prayed. You came down and you prayed for people in your life that, that did not know Christ. Maybe today, you just pray for yourself. You pray that the Lord, that you pray for more room in your heart for what the Lord wants to do through you. You pray for his power, and you pray for opportunity, and you pray for boldness. And you pray, you pray for God's divine power to work through you. Would you stand together as we sing, When I Survey the Wonders of Christ? When I survey.
Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for this time we're able to come together. Now, Lord, send us out into the harvest field. Lord, empower us, equip us. Use us, Lord. And Lord, we anticipate coming back in three days to celebrate your resurrection. In Christ's name, amen.